Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this session um, as the Cleveland Foundation's annual meeting presented by KeyBank continues. I'm Keisha Gonzalez. I am the Program Manager for Social Impact Investing and Community Development Initiatives here at the Cleveland Foundation. I am pleased uh, to present this breakout session, The Power of Unexpected Neighborhood Partnerships with my colleagues, Kimelon Dixon, Senior Project Director of Cleveland Purpose Built Communities, Indigo Bishop, Choice Neighborhoods Administrator for the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, and Ricardo Leon, Executive Director of Metro West Community Development Organization. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A features available to you via Zoom at the bottom of your screen to ask questions as we go. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can um, as we get to the end of today's presentation. Uh, thank you again for joining us today and let's get started. Um, Cleveland Foundation has very often um, been looked at as a leader in convening and collaboration. And what we've learned historically is that um, it is the most unlikely bedfellows that bring us the best fruit for positive impact in our communities. Um, so with that, we're gonna be having a, a very candid conversation around purpose-built communities and the Clark Fulton Community Master Plan known as Clark Fulton Together. Um, and with that, I will pass it along to Kimelon Dixon and Indigo Bishop to help uh, ground you guys in what's going on with purpose-built communities. Thank you so much, Keisha. I want to begin by deferring to my partner, Indigo Bishop of Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, who's really going to uplift her work with the Woodhill Choice, Woodhill Choice Neighborhood Implementation um, part. Right, thanks, Kamala. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Indigo Bishop. I'm the Choice Neighborhood Administrator for CMHA. I've been in this role for about two years, and it mostly entails project management and for a planning process managing stakeholder engagement, and developing partner relationships um, and collaborations for effective short-term and long-term neighborhood transformation. I'm going to get into a little more detail, but this is, on the screen, you see the map of the area where we're talking about in terms of purpose-built communities and uh, the choice neighborhood planning area footprint. Thank you, Indigo. Now I'm Kimeline Dixon, as Keisha previously introduced me. And my role is really, I represent a partnership between the Cleveland and St. Louis Foundation. And my role was primarily to implement the Purposeful Communities model, which originated out of Atlanta, Georgia about 20 years ago. My primary goal is to really replicate, but really personalize this model for Cleveland, specifically in two neighborhoods, Buckeye Wood Hill and in Glenville Circle North. And I must say within areas within both of those neighborhoods. The model itself is a holistic model of revitalization really built upon three strategic pillars. The first being mixed income housing with the goal to deconcentrate poverty. Education with the goal to construct a high quality educational pipeline from early learning through high school in the neighborhood. And then lastly, health and wellness, which is really broadly defined by community. It could include things like as public safety, public health, jobs, really those things that we know make for a good quality of life in our neighborhoods. And I can't speak about purpose build without talking about our partners. The partnership is really what makes this work come to life. And to really uplift the theme of this annual meeting, it's about community vision and really trying to activate the community's vision that it has for itself in these two particular neighborhoods. Our, our primary partner are the community. We also partner with the city of Cleveland, Cleveland Metropolitan School District, Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, the Famicos Foundation, Bourbon Bill Carr, and we are continuing to build partnerships as we evolve in our work. And I'm gonna stop there and share more with you and during the um, rest of our conversation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ricardo Leon, Executive Director of Metro West Community Development Organization. Uh, and I'm here to talk about the Clark Forum Together, which is Clark Forum, the Clark Forum Master Plan. Um, so just a brief history of just Clark Fulton very quickly, just so, you know, as you may be unfamiliar. Uh, the map here shows where we are kind of physically placed, you know, so south of I-90, north of the uh, Brookside Valley, and really honing in the, our plan itself kind of covers all of Clark Fulton neighborhood. And then uh, just to kind of stay within the boundaries of the highways, we, you know, there is a small sliver of Brooklyn Center as well as Stockyard, which are the two other communities that we serve as an organization. Um, so kind of what, why this is important, you know, and why this plan is so interesting to us is because it truly is a collaborative plan. Uh, Metro West, the CDC, you know, is the lead, you know, institutional organization leading the efforts, but it is truly collaborative in the sense that 
we are collaborating directly with uh, Ward 14 Councilwoman Jasmine Santana and her office, uh, the Metro Health System, the City of Cleveland Planning Commission, as well as the Cleveland Foundation. And why that's important is that we just, quite frankly, you know, from a neighborhood planning perspective, when you're looking at neighborhood planning, you know, from across the region and the city, you know, country, really, it's very rare to see uh, this collaborative nature between a community-based organization, a 501c3, and anchor institutions, right? Oftentimes, anchor institutions have the will and power to, to plan kind of their own areas. Um, and then also both an elected official of city and philanthropy. So we kind of have all five facets coming together for a community master plan uh, that is rooted in health, equity, sustainability, and resilience. Uh, and really the purpose of the plan ultimately, right, over the course of the next, you know, nine to 10 months or so that we'll still be working on this, is to really come up with a playbook for a neighborhood that has historically seen a significant amount of disinvestment and disenfranchisement and uh, develop a playbook for what development could look like for the next five to seven, 10 years um, in our community. And the reason why it's important contextually, uh, and you know, I can get into this a little bit more you know, later in, in the presentation, but uh, understanding that about two years ago, there was about zero dollars of econo economic activity in the ground in Clark Forum. Um, today, predominantly along the West 25th Street uh, corridor that you see here on the map, there's over $100 million of economic activity. We know of another 100 million, at least, that we're aware of that'll be coming in the next 18 to 24 months, and that doesn't include Metro Health's billion dollar campus transformation. And so this is why it's so important to now come together and develop this framework today in anticipation of all of this development activity that's coming in the future. And with the Cleveland Foundation's involvement in the Clark Fulton Master Plan, it was really an intentional way for us to ground ourselves as to how we actually wanted to come in um, and, and impact the neighborhood in a really meaningful fashion. Um, I think very often um, we're all kind of, uh, we're all practitioners in the space, who, uh, panelists here. Um, you know, we are guilty very often of coming in and imposing on our neighborhoods thinking that we know best. And I think this was a really intentional way um, to build a plan in partnership with neighbors, stakeholders, businesses, um, that they can actually hold us accountable, right? When something comes in, like when something breaks ground that isn't in that plan or that goes against the principles and values of the community established by participating in this plan, that we can be held accountable and that we can be responsive um, and, and, right the, and right course. Um, but one of the things that um, has really brought this panel together uh, is to really have a conversation around like the complexities and nuances of collaboration, right? We can talk for hours about processes. We can talk for hours about how to select a firm. Um, I know the Clark Fulton team spent months picking a firm, um, which was a great experience, but it's really that nuance of collaboration, building relationships, uh, rebuilding trust, moving at the speed of trust. Um, so I really want to kind of just have um, some candid conversation. Uh, I'd be very curious to kind of like start with Purpose Boat and kind of hear Kimelon how Purpose Boat came to Cleveland and how that relationship building and trust building has evolved over time to kind of really start to, to anchor that initiative. Sure. Our work with the national Purpose Boat communities began around 2015 when we really, well, when I heard about the model and understanding how this model has transformed other communities. And for us, it's really been around how can we align with our community partners? How can we coordinate so that we can leverage resources and ultimately achieve community impact? And to Keisha's point, it really has moved at the speed of trust. A big part of this work has been building relationship and trust with our partners in the community, with the residents. You know, I have to realize that I don't live in the neighborhoods that I'm working in, but yet I have to keep their best interests at heart. And I love when Keisha brought up the accountability part of it. I think that's um, really key to really building the type of collaboration that we need to be pure and authentic and something that keeps us grounded in this work. So when we heard about not just the purpose built model, but when we heard about other plans that were on the planning table with the city of Cleveland, with um, the housing authority, it became a really great time to align ourselves and work towards really aligning to understand how we can work better together. And I'm always saying that working better together, especially in neighborhoods like to Ricardo's point that had been intentionally set up for failure. These are neighborhoods that were not resourced well. They weren't um, located closest to uh, the neighborhood amenities that we're used to and make for good neighborhoods. So really the intentionality that we need, 
I think was our call to action. And as I was thinking about this presentation, I kind of envisioned a number of the initiatives that are already happening in the city, the city of Cleveland's Mayor's Neighborhood Transformation Initiative, the work that CMHA is doing, the work that the school district is doing, the work that RTA is doing. If you line them up in concentric circles, at the heart of all of that, the overlap or the center of it is community. And I think that that was really the call for the Cleveland St. Luke's Foundation to partner to really play a role in helping to activate community's vision, like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. Indigo? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think I would add one more thing, which is that sometimes um, knowing and seeing that there's a potential for overlap uh, between multiple partners um, is one thing, but sometimes it takes us a re really long time to like reach out and actually make the connection. Um, and sometimes it takes a third party um, outside of the, the direct work to say like, hey, are y'all talking to each other? <laughs> are, you, are you working and collaborating really together? Um, because there's this huge overlap and this opportunity um, to really benefit the work and to do the work better, like Kim Milan said. Um, so in our situation, that was Monique, uh, Monique Kelly Williams uh, brought us to, to the table, like literally to, to a meeting together uh, to iron out like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are the plans? Where are the overlaps? How can we help each other and not do more work than we need to do? Um, how can we benefit from the fact that we're both um, focusing all of our energy and attention on this place um, at this time? Yeah, there's a lot of give and take, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was huge. And then the other thing was we went on a trip early on with each other, a learning journey to Columbus. Um, which really, really um, benefited us in terms of building the relationship and starting to build trust with each other, but also um, in realizing that there was so much that we could learn from and with each other if we used each other the way that we could and should. I think when we look at the, um, the work with what's going on in, in Clark Fulton and the planning process, kind of like what brought us there was almost like this, um, it, this simultaneous shift in leadership, power dynamics, and this like overnight um, attraction of investment in the, in the neighborhood where we're kind of just like sitting there and we're just like, like Jesus, like <laughs> we have like no guiding direction. We know that we have to be responsive, but we also like don't have quite an understanding of like the type of tools that were needed at that moment in time to be able to dive into that. Um, and on top of that, we had a really budding um, new organization in Metro West um, that at that time wasn't even 10 years old and, and getting, you know, getting its sea legs. Um, so there was a, a lot, a lot of, um, of need for guiding principle for like all players in the neighborhood right now, from the anchor institution to the CDC to philanthropy, right? Um, and, and even to political leadership, which, you know, we, when we talk about like the nuances also of, of the intersection of, of the city and council in and of itself, right? Like how those kind of, how those, those relationships and responses impact like works such as planning, right? Or implementation or visioning or anything of that nature. It, it is a really, um, it, it's dynamic. It's never, it, it will never be monolithic, which makes, which makes it really hard for us to kind of stop and breathe and reflect, right? Like it's a very difficult space. Um, I'm not sure, Ricardo, if you want to add anything else in regards to kind of like how we all came to the table outside of like slight panic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I would just kind of very similar story. I think uh, we realized that there was a significant amount of need for planning, um, especially from the CDC perspective. Um, however, right, we have a ton of new leadership. So I was a new in my role, you know, summer of 2018. Um, Councilwoman Santana was very much kind of her first summer in her role as well. Um, the hospital was going through a big transition, you know, had kind of officially announced their campus transformation. Um, and I think we were all collectively, like, independently working towards, like, well, what, what does our future look like, right? You know, from the CDC's perspective, from the councilwoman's kind of goals and objectives, really, because she was really kind of came to a situation where she didn't really have a playbook. Um, and then what was going to be the hospital's new role, right? So, as they've been our anchor for 150 plus years, but this is, you know, a billion dollar investment doesn't happen every day. I'm not honest, I think it's the only billion dollar investment in the city at the moment. Uh, and it's on West 25th Street in the Hardest Park School neighborhood. And again, a neighborhood that have never seen any type of investment like this, even close. Um, and so we were all kind of like working towards our own individual plans. And then there was a meeting that we all had, uh, kind of like late 2018. So now, you know, a little over a year and a half ago, 
and I think we all kind of came to the conclusion, like, man, like, we're all kind of working towards the same thing, you know, like, we all have the same goals, maybe articulated a little bit differently, and ultimately maybe the, the end product, right, when it comes to, like, actually taking this plan and implementing it might look a little bit differently for each of us, but ultimately we all, we all have the same goal. Uh, and very similarly to the, to the story with Purposeville, um, we had someone kind of come in and really help kind of be the glue for us. And in my opinion, and I don't know if Casey, you disagree, but in my opinion, I feel like I was director, uh, Freddie Collier, director of city planning. Kind of Freddie really came to us and was like, hey, like, this is an opportunity to get this thing right, you know, and, and this is an opportunity to kind of revolutionize or at least evolve what planning at a neighborhood level looks like in the city of Cleveland. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, from going from a situation where the Clark Ford neighborhood has had um, many individual plans or like small bits and pieces of plans for different objectives and initiatives and never having a, a, you know, cohesive community master plan, um, going from that point to now having, you know, working on what might be or could be kind of the most comprehensive neighborhood plan in the city is honestly, you know, it's just a feat of, of everyone coming to the table, kind of putting their egos aside, their personal agendas aside, and saying, hey, how can we work on this together to get the best collective impact and the best, you know, outflow possible? And I think something that's really, really interesting um, is that we kind of all, and I've seen Kimalon do it, um, is that we kind of have our, um, this work is personal for a lot of us. Um, I grew up in Clark Fulton. Kimon has a really great story that she opens up when she does her purposeful presentation about like being that little girl and that and her brother um, that she works to strive to have this type of just like inclusive um, thriving community for right. So like, I think those notions also about the, the components of the work being so personal um, also bring that added level of collaboration, right? So it's not just like our professional being that we bring into these dynamics, but we're also bringing a lot of personal, um, both baggage and vision, right? Because we, we it's, it's influential, it helps form it, it helps us know what not to do and what to keep and what to move forward with. Um, you know, so with that being said, and, and, I, and I think it's really important um, and how those elements reflect in the conversations around power dynamics. Right. So like in both bodies of work, we have purpose built and this Clark Fulton planning where we have these intersections between government and, and political leadership, um, you know, institutions like philanthropy. Uh, power is a huge, it's a big, it's a big issue. I'd be really curious for folks to chime in around how you guys have all kind of just either like navigated power dynamics, have been able to transition to perhaps more level ground where you're looking at each other as peers and less as competition for one another. Um, Cause I think it's a really important shift for the entire community development sector um, as we are starting to think about this work as, with equitable outcomes. Well, I guess I'll start. For me, I had to realize that the power that I represent when I walk into a room, even though I walk in with the spirit of partnership, I have to realize that I am still, um, I still represent two foundations in this community that fund a number of our nonprofit partners. So for me, it's really around realizing that and understanding how I can build trust so I can really get a true vision of what the community wants for itself. And when I mean that, I always tell people, I don't wanna hear what you think I wanna hear, tell me the truth. You know, a part of that is really keeping myself open and recognizing that and really deferring to um, my partners and community to tell me or to inform how I move forward. You know, we've been working really hard to develop a governance structure that will share power with our residents, with our nonprofit partners, so that the, these systems that are coming into play, no one is taking over, no one is being prescriptive and telling community what they want for their community. And I think that was really important. You know, there are times I hold back in meetings because it's something that I want, that Kim Alon wants. But I have to realize that community knows what's best for itself especially those people that live, work, play, and worship in those communities. So for me, it's about checking my ego at the door and really listening. I do a lot of listening, and I like to show people that I'm listening by the work that we do and how we move forward, how we navigate, because I think that negates a lot of what we talk about if we don't show people that we are listening and that we are activating that which they, that they're giving us. To add on to that, 
add on to that, I would say that um, it also really requires you to know and recognize and be honest with yourself about what are the strengths within your organization um, or within yourself personally, like where are you strong and where are you weak, and, um, and to be able to objectively see that with other groups that you want to partner with, um, where are they strong and where are they weak, and where can you fill in each other's gaps uh, to really reinforce um, each other and make the work go farther and be more effective. Because um, just like you said, uh, Keisha, it can often feel oppositional or territorial. Like, this is my place, this is my area, this is my, my thing. Um, but it also, uh, I think, stems from sometimes not wanting to share, um, share the glory of a success before uh, the steps that even happen to lead you towards success at all. Um, and so when we're willing to, to see honestly where we can provide and where we could get some help, um, it opens the door for, for collaboration and for us to be able to actually um, move the needle on some really, really tough things that have been around for a long time. It's going to take a lot more than one organization to move the needle on anything. So. Yeah, just to jump in out there, I echo um, for everything that came on. And I think even to, to that same point, one thing that we did um, we really kind of put it out and write it. You know, we kind of put together like a memorandum of understanding, and then now, as a part of like a parallel effort that's really wrapped into our master planning process, with the eco district process, with central health system, it's uh, pursuing the certification for. There's a declaration of collaboration. Really, what that document says that we will all be signing um, it, it's just a statement of like how we want to engage with each other, how we will work with each other in this plan, what is the purpose of this work, and then ultimately how we can hold each other accountable. Uh, and I think we, from the very beginning, from very early on, um, we understood that, you know, when we get together and have conversation, it's like family, right? We can be brutally honest with each other. Sometimes, like, it, you know, you might feel a certain way. You might not, you know, you might walk out of this feeling like, oh, man, that was maybe not what I was expecting to walk into. But ultimately, we know that we can be honest with each other. We can be, we can say things factually and respectfully, obviously. Um, and ultimately, we can overcome kind of any differences that we might have. You know, and we, you know, kind of going through this process, we've had multiple times where we kind of had to come back together and say, hey, like, I got to get this off my chest, or, 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 you know, I think we need to do things this way, and maybe this, is a, maybe this isn't what we were originally intending, but this is what I think is the right approach. Um, and luckily, I think up to this point, we've been very open with each other and allowing each other that flexibility uh, and really holding each other accountable throughout this process. And, and I think that's what has allowed us to be a successful, you know, up to this point. So, you know, as you guys think about as collective entities, like working towards neighborhood transformation, um, you know, what does, how, how has these processes, some of us having done them for over two years, um, how is this influencing your ability, how you're visioning your ability to create space and share power and collaborative decision making in the future, right? Because I'm assuming there's no going back from what you've learned. Um, so what, where, where are your guys' kind of minds um, when it comes to what the future looks like based on what you've learned through this process thus far? It actually makes me wonder if I'm doing enough now. Like as I, as I think about my now, my present, how can I do more to really be collaborative in the um, decision making, to really share power in a very intentional and real way? And then looking forward, I think, especially with purpose, but right now it's very conceptual and people always ask me, well, what is purpose built? And right now it's a concept that we are working so hard, so feverishly to bring to life so that when you drive through our neighborhoods, the transformation will be real and apparent. But I always think about how can I design this work so that it's sustainable and so that the community owns it. And really that means around setting up a really strong foundation that we have enabled community to be a really big part of and how we develop and design our work. In other cities, Purpose Builds its own 501c3. We are choosing not to do that here in Cleveland, first because we have a wealth of great nonprofit partners in our community that is just really a matter of connecting to and aligning with. And then secondly, we believe that we have the wherewithal to really carry this work forward. And so I always think about what can I do better and what, what can I do more of to make sure that we're sharing power and really creating community ownership of this work. From my perspective, it requires a lot of slowing down and pushing against 
um, timelines and schedules to do the engagement work in a truly authentic way, um, which is messier uh, and less linear. It's not direct. It's you're going to be winding all around. It's going to take longer. It might be more expensive, uh, but the outcome is, is uh, effective development that is sustainable and that actually benefits people's lives who live there now um, and that makes their lives better in the short term and the long term. Um, so just knowing that that's important and to committing to do that um, in terms of how we invest staff time, dollars, all kinds of resources in, in doing the community development work that we, that we know needs to be done. Yeah, again, I agree wholeheartedly with both uh, sentiments. I mean, we have to do, we always have to do more. You know, I think we always try to do the best that we can, and, and that's just kind of a moving goalpost no matter what. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the last six months, right, since COVID uh, has shown us uh, doing a, a planning process in communities um, where the traditional forms of engagement are much more face to face, knocking on doors and information out to people, right, where we have these massive digital divides, you know, less, you know, half of the population in our neighborhoods don't have regular access to the Internet. Um, we've had to get incredibly creative about how we get to people, right, because we can't do the old block clubs and the neighborhood kind of parties and things of that nature that we've done in the past. And so we really had to just find ways to, to be more collaborative. And I think what we found is that there's no reason not to do that moving forward, right? We should be popping up on our local days where we sit. You know, we should be dropping around the neighborhood with caravan and handing out information. You know, we should be finding, you know, alter, alternate ways to get in front of folks that uh, kind of mold that traditional engagement, you know, civic and community engagement model that we've seen across neighborhood organizations. Um, and I think we're basically laying the groundwork for what this will look like, you know, at least from like the CDC perspective, from the organization's engagement tactics moving forward, you know, until the next time they have to fall. Absolutely. So I want to be um, mindful that we have questions building up in the Q&A. Um, and for those in the audience, please feel free to continue to, to jump in with any questions that you may have. Um, and right now, we kind of would like to um, jump into um, kind of addressing some of the questions that we have in the Q&A. Um, so Jeff Burgos says, shout out from Roberto Clemente Park. Um, hey. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, Orlando uh, Santeja Jr. Uh, so he wanted to know how do residents uh, get involved, right? So both respectively for Purpose Bill and the Clark Fulton Master Plan, can you kind of give us some insight about how residents get involved? Uh, yeah, I can just jump up for the Clark Fulton. So we have um, website, social media accounts, ClarkFultonTogether.com, Clark Fulton Together on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, and through there, there's a variety of ways you can get involved. So like the, first, the easiest way is a community survey, you know, something that we would have historically done face-to-face, -face, right, doing it in person, but now you can take that information online uh, and kind of respond to a series of questions. It's a little long, but it really will help us really understand where our residents are and what they mean. Um, additionally, there will be a calendar of events on there that shows kind of where we will be at, where we will be popping up at, what, you know, what, where you can find us in person. Um, there's also a link to like, all of any types of presentations that we've given, like this or others, um, will all be on the website as well and through our YouTube. Um, so again, in understanding that right now it's, it's not tough for people to engage, we're trying to give folks as many different options as possible. But you can always always just pick up the phone and call us down at Metro West or shoot an email off. We're you know we're happy to talk about this no matter you know with anyone in any way. Um, ultimately, we just want to be able to get the word out and continue getting residents involved because this really is their plan and we want them to be in the driver's seat. And I'd like to add on that too, there's a multitude of other plans going on within the Clark Fulton area as well. Um, there's a, a West 25th Street um, plan with the or with RTA, right, for the BRT. Um, and additionally, there is some feedback being asked for um, in regards to some green space and some uh, insight as to how Clark Recreation could be used, right? So even though they're not directly tied to the Clark Fulton Master Plan, there's different avenues for you to plug in content that's being cross-pollinated by a variety of different partners. Kim Alon, how do people get involved? I was looking at Indigo that she could hear, hear my thoughts. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're very similar to what Ricardo said. In Buckeye Woodhill, there's social media, there's a Facebook page for, and we're leaning on our partnership with CMHA with Woodhill Up Next to really engage people in that neighborhood. But we are also establishing our own social media. People can reach out to me directly. 
In Glenville, we'll also be implementing a community engagement strategy. The work, as I always tell people, is in two stages of, de of development in each neighborhood. So I'm open for anybody to reach out to me directly or through our various social media outlets as well, Facebook for sure, and we will be um, unveiling the rest of them coming forward this year. Unfortunately, COVID happened, and that's when we were planning to be out in the neighborhood and talking to people and, you know, face-to-face, -face, but we have transitioned to a virtual way of communing and communicating. So we have a question from Julie Johnson. You know, how do you need your nonprofit partners to engage at this point or to be able to, or to be at the table to assist in this endeavor? As we spoke of earlier with our governance structure, we've developed neighborhood executive committees for each neighborhood. And we have been, and we also have transformation teams as well that will be engaging our nonprofit partners to really talk about how we can fill community need and how we can build community vision. Because those are two different things, right? We wanna have an abundance, abundance mindset. We don't wanna always have a scarcity mindset. So I think that's the best way that our partners can really play a role in how we activate the vision for each neighborhood. No, those are great. Um, one of the things that we were finding early on is the benefit of having one-on-one uh, -on -one or small group conversations with our partners in terms of um, sharing the needs assessment and data that we've collected uh, around the footprint uh, more recently. Uh, but even uh, in those meetings, things would come up when they would say, have you heard that there was a plan uh, that was shelved like five years ago and they did a lot of this similar, they were asking similar questions. They had similar outcomes that they were looking to see. Um, and so uh, they often helped us dig up other data that would be valuable, either from their organization or a group that did something in the past. Um, but also knowing what that organization is investing in right now in the neighborhood or interested in piloting um, uh, are, are hugely helpful so that we can figure out how to incorporate those strategies into um, into the interventions that, that we're planning and make sure that we're all on the same page and on the same accord and capitalizing on the assets that already exist. So we've got about five minutes left and I want to take those last five minutes um, to kind of give you all a chance to kind of just leave some, some parting words um, to kind of help us inspire us as we're thinking about the vision um, for our communities moving forward. Um, we have a lot of new tools in our toolbox. We have a new, a lot more alignments and opportunities. Um, and we have a lot more responsibility. Now, um, when we look at COVID and we look at the current state of racial dynamics in this country, um, you know, what are we doing moving forward? Well, I will say this to the point that you made earlier, Keisha, this work is very personal to me. And the story I always share is that the, the systems that I'm working to impact, I've directly um, been involved with myself or impacted myself between the public school system, between being born in Buckeye Woodhill, between growing up in public housing. So for me, the work is hard but necessary. I feel like I have, um, I owe it to my community to take all that I've been given to give back and to work through those areas of adversity to make something good and great happen for the people who live there now. I was um, along similar lines. Um, I, I like how you framed it in the beginning that sometimes the, the personalness of the work um, can add value and sometimes it can bring baggage. And I think for me, um, because I, I live in the neighborhood and was born in the neighborhood, um, there's a different level of like urgency around it uh, and it can really facilitate improper self-care. <laughs> if I'm being honest. So I think taking care of yourself, especially if you're, um, if you have that strong connection and feel like your own self-interest and well-being is tied up in the success of the work, um, that you slow down and pace yourself and lean on your partners um, so that you don't feel that you have to do it by yourself because you don't um, and you're not alone in the work um, and you're not the, 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 gonna be the hero to save the day. It's gonna be a collaborative effort. Um, and you're gonna burn yourself out if you try and do it by yourself. Well, I would uh, echo the same sentiments <laughs> itself. I mean, I'm a lifelong resident of the neighborhood too, or, you know, project CMSD, and so uh, being able to like live and work in a neighborhood 
in the same neighborhood is, is a super dope opportunity, but it can be taxing too, right? And so sometimes you just kind of have to separate yourself a little bit. Um, and I think that is where, like, the reliance on, like, partnerships is super important, is incredibly important, uh, and having, like, a good team, right, of folks that um, maybe sometimes having the outside perspective is super important too, right, because, you know, as a resident in the neighborhood, I see it the way I've seen it my whole life, and, and the way I see things might not be realistic or it might be, you know, tainted by just, like, my experience in the community, right? Um, and so that's something that's really important, you know, for us is just kind of always being able to, like, ground ourselves in the work but also be able to kind of take a step away and say, hey, like, I, you know, I need to make sure that I'm getting, you know, other lens, right? Uh, and then something I just want to point out, there's a couple of questions that popped up just in the Q&A, um, and one of them was around workforce development. And so I just wanted to say, like, we, you know, I can speak to the fact that we are certainly, workforce development is always a priority, you know, with planning and just with our just general work as a CDC. Um, and one of the biggest things of this plan is how do, can we create economic opportunity, right? And that starts with workforce opportunities, increasing entrepreneurship so we can have more uh, black and brown-owned businesses in our communities that are representative of our, of our community uh, and really have more of an ownership stake just in the community itself. And so uh, we have kind of varied tactics on how we're working towards that, but ultimately that is one of the main parts, of, you know, one of our main goals is how can we increase economic opportunity in, and, again, in communities that have historically not had much. So the last question before we close out, uh, who's available for consulting opportunities next year? <laughs> <laughs> so you got a pretty good I'll roster survive. of folks here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of my board here. <laughs> I just want to take a real sincere moment to thank you guys. Like your guys' work came on, you know, you, ground, you, you influence and ground my work and to go I watch you as, you, as you're navigating these institutions for the betterment of community and Ricardo just working neck and neck with you um, in the Clark Fulton area. Like you guys are all doing phenomenal work and we are looking forward um, to how it's gonna influence the system and the sector. And as we just continue to learn from one another, um, I'd like to uh, pass it over to Kim Alon to close off the session. Okay. Thank you all again for attending today's session. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Please join me in giving a virtual round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> After this, you'll receive an invitation to take a brief community survey. We greatly value your feedback, so please consider sharing your thoughts about today's event as well as your vision for Greater Cleveland. Also, there is still time to register for more exciting annual meeting weekend activities on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Please check out the rest of the series at www.cleavelandfoundation.org slash annual meeting. Have a great afternoon. Thank you again.